Uh, next we've got William Fawcett, so um, works for NASA, talking about how, NASA, how they're using AI to find evidence of life on, life on NASA. So let's give a big round of applause for William. Uh, thank you everyone, and uh, good evening. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually a research associate at the University of Cambridge, but uh, I recently started working in partnership uh, with something called the NASA Frontier Development Lab. Um, and this is uh, a project that's put together to, to bring people from different fields uh, to try and use machine learning to answer some big questions that NASA has. Um, so just a bit of background on this program, this Frontier Development Lab program. It's a, uh, a sort of a research accelerator. Um, as I said, to try to bring together data scientists and machine learning experts with people who are domain experts. So people who have uh, specialist knowledge in planetary science or um, Earth observation. And uh, this year, there was a number of challenges posed uh, to, the, uh, um, to the development lab. Uh, and these are the five challenges uh, that we face. Um, so space resources, space weather, astrobiology, which is the search for life uh, beyond the solar system or beyond Earth. Earth observation and exoplanets. And each one of these uh, research themes uh, try to bring together different machine learning techniques to try and um, get at these. Now, I, you know, people, could, someone could give a talk on each one of these uh, projects uh, here, but I, I'm just going to briefly touch on exoplanets and, and astrobiology. So, what, what is it really? Um, so, the FDR program is actually of course, a bunch of, of people that are brought together from all over the world and from a whole bunch of disciplines. Um, I, for example, have a background in particle physics, uh, which is, you know, quite related from space science. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, someone who is a bit different. Uh, I was sort of thrown thro into this, this program to work with uh, other experts and, and see what I could offer and also get see what I could get back from there. And so the, one of the questions we were faced is, and it's quite a big one: Are we alone? And it's a question that people have asked ever since the dawn of mankind. And it's very easy for me to stand here in front of you uh, with a, this bold question and bold lettering and historic background. But another thing is, you know, how the hell are you going to actually try and have a go answering this? And so the talk uh, that I'm going to give here is, is basically how to find life in four easy steps. So the first thing you need to do, well, the first problem that we face is that the galaxy is very big, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, there's something like 100 billion stars in the galaxy, and we think that about 40 billion of those stars will have a uh, planet orbiting it that could potentially host life. So looking at all these stars in the galaxy, you know, the first thing you need to do is actually find those planets. Um, and the method that is used to do this is known as the one of the methods you do this is called the transit method, um, and this is this is actually a picture of our sun and uh, I think it's Mercury uh, going in front of the star, uh, in front of the sun. And what you can do is measure the luminosity from the sun uh, before the planet passes in front of it, and then as it goes in front, you can see that the luminosity drops, um, and then when it's on, when it's finished going past, the luminosity returns to normal. Um, so this is a very nice example. Uh, this, this star happens very close to us. It's our own star. Um, but you can imagine if this was uh, hundreds of thousands of light years away, this dip would be almost indistinguishable from noise. Uh, and this is actually one of the, uh, actually being able to tease out, you know, from the data, if there's really a planet in there, uh, was one of the challenges of the FDR program. Um, so this is, this, is our, uh, this is our star. Um, and this is a picture of um, a real exoplanet, uh, one of the first to ever be uh, found. And you can see it's you know, very pixel. So this is the host star, and uh, this is just a dim glow of the uh, exoplanet. And just to give you sort of an idea of how, how tricky it is to find something like this, uh, an analogy you can take home is it's like trying to spot a, a firefly flying next to a, a, a torchlight from uh, a thousand miles away. So this, the second step uh, is to try and measure the atmospheric spectrum. Now using the transit method is, is quite fortunate because uh, part of the light that uh, 
you, you follow the light, uh, passes through the planet's atmosphere, and, and certain wavelengths are absorbed by the atmosphere. And so you can see in this, uh, this plot over here that uh, certain bits of the spectrum that have been eaten away by different gases. Um, and then the challenge, uh, one of the challenges here is, uh, for example on Earth, the, the atmosphere makes up only about 1.5% of the radius uh, of the planet. So, as difficult as it is to even find these exoplanets, it's even more difficult to try and get, uh, get at the atmospheric uh, composition. Uh, and if getting those uh, molecules in the atmosphere isn't difficult enough, you then have to do the next step, which is to take this spectrum and then turn it into what the atmosphere may actually look like. Um, and I'll talk about this uh, in more detail later. And then lastly, step after that, if that wasn't difficult enough, is then to go from the atmosphere to see if there are any uh, biohints, any signals of life. So a biohint, for example, could be uh, that there's evidence of uh, H2O water in the atmosphere, uh, and you could measure the temperature of the atmosphere, which would give you an indication of the temperature on the surface of the planet, and that could tell you if there's liquid water uh, on the planet's surface which is something that we know, at least for life on Earth, uh, is required uh, for life to exist. So this is sort of the, the, the chain of uh, what to do to try and find life. And there's a lot of machine learning problems inside here. So, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the challenges was uh, the exoplanet challenge uh, using machine learning to try and pick out these planets uh, from the uh, transit data. Um, and another machine learning challenge is actually trying to get uh, from the spectra, which is something you would measure, to the atmosphere. Uh, and then another problem is the coupling of how does biology actually interact with the atmosphere, which is a very complex problem. Um, but I'm mostly going to focus on um, this step here. So we actually understand atmospheres uh, relatively well, at least compared to some of the other problems here. So, going from a known atmosphere to something like a spectrum is, is relatively easy to do. We have uh, tools to be able to generate this. But to be able to go back from something we could possibly measure in the future to what the atmosphere was actually like is very hard to do. Um, we have methods to do this, but it's extraordinarily uh, computationally intensive. Um, and this is where machine learning can uh, come in to try and uh, improve this reverse process. Um, one of the problems that we faced uh, is, of course, uh, the number of rocky, we don't know, uh, of many, very many rocky exoplanets in the galaxy. Uh, these are particularly hard to find because they're usually quite small and also usually quite close to the sun, which, uh, their host star, which means they don't, uh, uh, don't block out much of the light from that host star. Uh, so at the moment, uh, the current satellites we have uh, aren't good enough to be able to get at these rocky planets. The next generation of satellites will be, uh, but we're starting already to think about how we're going to get uh, um, get the atmospheres from, from the spectrum measurement. So because we don't have any real data, the first problem we can do is, is generate some. Uh, so NASA has uh, something called the Planetary Spectrum Generator, which takes in a uh, total of 28 parameters, uh, including the parameters of the telescope that you're using, uh, parameters of the planet uh, and the star that this planet is orbiting around, uh, and then 12 gas concentrations which correspond to the atmosphere that you're interested in. So you put all these ingredients into your spectrum generator and you get out uh, a nice spectrum. And one of these is something like 4,000 data points per spectrum, uh, and in total we, we, we generated about 2.5 million of these. Um, you'll see we have a lot of uh, industry parts bottom, I should mention that we used a Google Cloud uh, technology to actually uh, generate so many. Uh, then the next thing to do um, was to try and tackle the reverse problem. So we have all these spectra, uh, and we essentially have a labelled uh, training data set, uh, and then we want to go backwards. Um, so uh, we actually uh, started with just some very uh, basic methods, just to try and um, uh, you know, to test this thing out. Uh, we started with a linear regression model. Uh, we also tried feed for neural networks and neural networks. Um, and then essentially did a, 
a model grid search uh, just to find which one of these was the best. And by best, I mean have the um, uh, smallest uh, loss. Um, and then, of course, we tune this model, uh, and then uh, the current model that we had been using was, was the combination of that. Um, so the model we actually uh, use for this, um, well, I, I give sort of the, the details here. It's uh, a few layers, um, uh, uh, combination of layers, uh, different um, different functions used there. Um, at the time, uh, we only had uh, generated a few hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of points. So for training, we used about 100,000 uh, spectra. Uh, for validation, 10,000 and for testing, um, about 7,000, and you can sort of see here quickly how um, the, the, the loss uh, decreased the function of the number of bucks, and uh, the blue is it. the training sample, and the, the orange is the validation. So some results from, from this. Um, so uh, on the right-hand side, uh, this is for a single planet or a single atmosphere. And um, the histograms show uh, our attempt at uh, sort of estimating the accuracy of our model. So we used a, a dropout method to remove uh, nodes at random, and we did that 600 times for a, a certain planet, and then generated a distribution um, of, uh, you know, for example, how much uh, water it, it thinks there is in that atmosphere and how much um, methane. And uh, you can see, actually, so the black lines uh, represent the, the prediction from the, the model, and the red lines uh, represent the, the truth. And so you can see it, it's actually doing pretty well uh, here. And then these two plots on the left, uh, these just show uh, the difference between the prediction of our model and the actual truth. Uh, so it's again, the same at each two rows and um, the same. And you can see that these are fairly correlated, so you know, we, we knew we were sort of um, but what what might you then do once you've had all of these atmospheres? Um, you know, we, we, we couldn't necessarily say that a single atmosphere has uh, very precisely what what um, properties it may have, but we benefit from the fact that there's many planets out there. So, you, for example, um, one one next step you could do is take only the planets that are very similar to Earth, for example, and if there's enough of them, maybe you can start doing some sort of statistical tests on them. So, for example, you could measure the temperature of the atmosphere, uh, and you can come up with um, a model of what you might expect for an Earth-like planet um, without any biology on, on it. Uh, and then you could also perhaps come up with a, either, either um, a model where you, you feed in some biology to this model, um, and then you would perhaps look at the data points uh, from your uh, large collection of planets. And maybe this could be used as a method to actually find life in the universe. So it may not be that uh, you, we're getting a phone call from an alien, but it may be a, a statistical test that actually tells us this is life in the universe uh, outside of Earth. Um, I have to credit uh, the colleagues that I've worked with. So the work I'm presenting here is, is not just mine. Uh, but it's the work of all of these people. Uh, these were the other researchers at uh, the Interior Development Lab this year, uh, working on the Astrobiology Project. Um, there's a few links here, um, just to some of the packages we made. So, uh, Inara is the machine learning package we actually used to uh, do this. Um, we, we are creating a data set of about 3 million spectra, uh, which we will make publicly available uh, after our publication. Um, of course, I have to thank the industry partners for making this possible, and uh, finally, uh, thank you, and do you have any questions? Do some Q&A. Thanks, William. Any, anyone got any questions for William? Giovanni at the back? If you could give me your name, sir, and your um, organisation. It's Giovanni from Saudi, and a lot of scientists. Actually, I have a pretty simple, maybe stupid question. So, what is the state of that? What is the, where are you at? I mean, what of these four steps? Which one can you say you 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 have some conclusive evidence? Conclusive evidence of what? So, right now, the latest satellite that um, 
So right now, we're in fact all the way back, back here. So actually, most exoplanets don't even look this good. Uh, this, is a, this is a really close by one. Most planets that we can, or, or rather stars, you can maybe get a single pixel out of that. Um, and so all you can do is measure the sort of intensity of this, this pixel as the planet goes, and, as it goes past. Um, but actually, the past few months, uh, a new satellite has been launched, the TESS satellite, which is, uh, has been specifically designed uh, to search for exoplanets. So, by the way, this, this photo was actually taken in 2005. So, in 2005, we did not know if there were any planets outside of the solar system. So, this is still quite a very, very new thing. Um, there are also future plan uh, plans for after this, uh, the new satellite test. Uh, the, the next satellite will be the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, that's going to be the, uh, the big replacement to Hubble. And that will be able to do uh, some of this uh, atmospheric retrieval. Uh, and then after that even, there's, a, there's another telescope that's sort of in the pipeline uh, that will be you know, even better and uh, able to, to retrieve these atmospheres. Great stuff. Great question, Giovanni. Hello, uh, my name is Gary McCree, I'm South um, I've got a two part question. I was wondering if you could go into any more detail about the packages, the algorithms, and the volumes of data that we use. And part B would be uh, do you think you're far off from developing the theoretical conditions that could be used to create an artificial planet? So the theoretical conditions to create an artificial planet, maybe I'll, I'll stop that one first. Um, it depends how much detail you want to go into and how precise you want your results to be. I mean, we already have this, uh, this, this planetary spectrum generator, which can give you the atmosphere of a planet if you tell it what its ingredients are. Um, there's certain limitations to this. For example, it's difficult to simulate what the clouds in this atmosphere would be like. Um, but maybe you could get uh, the concentrations of the certain gases right to a couple of percent. In terms of the volumes of data and packages, um, and so to actually do a lot of the sort of testing uh, of the different um, of the different kinds of neural uh, uh, machine learning methods we use, PyTorch and um, TensorFlow for the, the, the final CNN, um, we actually put uh, this Planet PSG tool into, into Docker, into a Docker container. Quite, uh, it's very handy. Um, volumes of data, so you get two, two and a half million to three million spectra, um, maybe tens of terabytes in storage. Something like that. I hope that answers your question. Uh, hi, hi, uh, I have a question. I send that. Your output is uh, 12 uh, normalized concentration for gases. Uh, was, yes. Was there any gas that was easier to predict, and what kind of metrics do you use for the performance of uh, uh, measuring the performance? Um, yes, yes, so some, some gases were easier to pick than others. Uh, unfortunately, I, the, there's, there's 12 of them, so you get this 12 by 12 matrix. Uh, I don't have the plot in my talk, unfortunately. Um, in terms of how we actually chose those gases, um, we uh, so um, we didn't allow all the gases to vary completely at random. We put certain limits um, on different gases based on you know realistic constraints about the atmosphere, um, and sampled these randomly, but then um, weighted them such that you know all the concentrations would add up to, to one, uh, and, and these were all sampled with a flat. Uh, in between the range available. Okay, good stuff. All right, so we've got uh, two more questions. Colin, Colin Robert, um, I'm, I'm picking up on your speculative fifth step <laughs> by asking an extremely speculative question. If you had to put money down for detecting life, either as a result of passive markers like you've been searching for, or active signaling, where do you think uh, where do you think we'll discover advanced intelligences? Well, I, you know, I... I <laughs> Well, I don't think you said that was advanced intelligences. So, um, a, a lot of what this could be used is, is just to find, you know, bacteria on, on a planet that creates some gas. If I was to, you know, to, to put money in a question like this, when we, we have absolutely no, we don't, have no idea about what might be out there. Um, 
And uh, we don't even know if there could even be life on Mars or on other uh, moons in, in the solar system. And we haven't even gone there yet. I don't know, it's, it's not something I can even put a wager on. Uh, I mean, well, I, I think I like this method because it's sort of statistical. Uh, and, you know, if you were really able to do this, um, then you could potentially look at a, a large portion of the galaxy all at the same time. And if it actually made any sense to, to, to look at these two distributions, then I think that could be quite helpful to take uh, Yeah, please, please take note that at this point, this is very much uh, speculation. Just to go back to the planetary spectrum generally, is there any kind of a chicken and egg situation there? Because and ultimately, this is trying to generate um, sample data based on uh, observations that you don't have, you just generate. Apart from our solar system, for example, the variation of star types, that I'm interested in that. Um, you know, how do you get around the chicken and egg situation where, in effect, you're solving your own problem? Yeah, that, that's, that is a, a good question, thank you. Um, it's true that we only know about a handful of atmospheres in, in the solar system. Um, but we also do know about Earth's atmosphere throughout its history. So that gives us a lot more data points than uh, you might uh, naively expect. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's true that this is you know, potentially a problem. We don't really know how an atmosphere would, would behave on an exoplanet. But you know, we have to try and do this. We just have to take the, the best knowledge that we have. And, and that's, that's, that's just the best we can do. But yeah, it's a limitation of this. Okay, Brad, I'm just going to throw a really quick one in there. Last question. So, if you had the opportunity to be the one of the first passengers on SpaceX, would you, would you take up the opportunity and say yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Very brave man. Now let's give William a big round of applause.